Data science and advanced analytics are the primary use cases for Python and Excel. If you check out my other videos on my YouTube channel, this is crystal clear. Now, that being said, I will be the first one to tell you that if you're getting all the insights that you need using out-of-the-box features of Microsoft Excel, then you don't need Python and Excel. You got everything you need. However, if we make an assumption that Python and Excel is all about empowering millions of professionals to use data science and advanced analytics, then we have a fundamental question that we need to answer. Can you actually use Python and Excel to do real world data science? So I decided to answer this question by testing out Python and Excel and seeing if it would scale to real world data science workloads. I'm leveraging my experience as a hands-on analytics and data science consultant to determine these scenarios. And they are visual data analysis, cluster analysis, decision tree machine learning models, and random forests. All four of those are in the sweet spot of applied business analytics. I've used them over and over again with my clients. I've used them over and over again when I was an employee with previous companies, including Microsoft. So they are a great place to test out, hey, does Python and Excel actually scale to data science workloads. And by the way, if you're interested in jumpstarting your data science skills, be sure to check out my free machine learning crash courses. There are links below this video in the description. You can sign up for them. You can watch them on your own time. You get the code, you get the data, you get everything that you need to start building your machine learning skills. So check those out if you're interested. So with all that as a background, we then have to decide, hey, what data sets are we going to use to actually test Python and Excel to see if it scales to data science workloads? So the first thing that we need to note is this. At the time of this recording, Python and Excel is limited to 100 megabytes. So you package up your data, you package up your code, you send it up to the Azure cloud, Microsoft's cloud, and that package is limited to 100 megabytes, both up and down. So keep that in the back of your mind. And by the way, I need to go on a little bit of a rant. Please forgive me. If you're one of those people that think you're super cool because you work with tens of millions of rows of data or hundreds, or hundreds of millions of rows of data, great. I've done it too. I've done analysis with tens of millions of rows of telemetry data. That's all great. But here's the reality. The vast majority of business analytics that is done in organizations around the world every day is not working with tens of millions of rows of data. <laughs> far, far less. There's a reason why Excel is king. So keep this in the back of your mind. 100 megabytes might seem like a huge limitation, but this is Python in Excel. So keep that in the back of your mind. This is for Excel size data. Okay, ran over. I apologize for that. Let's take a look at the data sets. So we're looking for a sweet spot of data sets that we can use that simulate real world kinds of Excel data science use cases. And what we can see here is, for example, the data visualization scenario, I'm using a data set that has 336,000 rows. So this was actually loaded into a table in a worksheet in Excel, and it has 19 columns. And that's pretty standard for the kinds of things that I see. This is a good example of narrow, not a lot of columns, but very, very long data sets. I see this quite a bit in the real world. And by the way, just so you know, I've actually built production machine learning model systems that were built with less rows of data than this, just so you know. Now, here's what's really super critical. When doing the testing, I pushed the data up to the Azure Cloud in Python and Excel and brought it back down and then asked Python how big was the table of data or the pandas data frame in Python terminology. And you can see that listed here. So this particular data set clocked in at 48.8 megabytes which is half of the limit. So it gives you some idea of what's going on in terms of scale. Now, the next data set that I used for clustering essentially is the opposite. It's actually relatively short in terms of rows, but it's wide in terms of columns. So 10,000 rows, 784 columns. And that clocked in at 59.8 megabytes, which is still well within the 100 megabyte limit. So that also gives you some idea in terms of like, hey, Dave, I actually have lots of columns. Will Python and Excel work? Yeah, it might. Might. And this gives you a good example. And then I have another clustering data set just to you know, put it through its paces. And what we can see here is it's only 2,200 rows, 16 columns, and it's a measly 0.276 megabytes. <laughs> but by the way, this is actually a very realistic scenario in my experience working with customers of all sizes. So this is another data set. And then lastly, I have the predictive modeling scenario. This is where I'm building decision tree models. I'm building random forest models. And what I'm using here is a data set of 32,000 500-ish rows, 15 columns, which clocks in at 3.7 megabytes. Now you might be thinking to yourself, Dave, why are you using such a dramatically small data set for predictive modeling? Keep that in the back of your mind. When we start talking about decision trees, I'll explain why, because this number actually explodes. Here's the data visualization results. 
I was using Python formulas in my workbook using the manual setting. By default, Python and Excel will run every single Python formula over and over and over again. It's super annoying. I don't know why they make that the default. I'm assuming it's because other formulas in Excel, that's the default, but ugh, <laughs> it's terrible. Anyway, I was running these step-by-step -step one at a time in isolation so that I could actually time them. And here's the methodology that I used. So you can in in Python and Excel, in your Excel formulas, you can use something that's known as magic. That's literally what it's called. It's called magic. It's called percentage percentage time. Because what happens is behind the scenes, your code is pushed up and run in what's known as a Jupyter Notebook in the Azure cloud. And this time magic will allow you to time how long it takes for the code to run. And this wall time essentially says, look, if you were in the Azure data center, watching the container run your, your piece of Python code, and you were watching the clock on the wall, how long would the clock go before the Python code was done executing. That's what wall time means. And notice this is all in seconds. So what we can see here is that on average, I ran five executions and that was the methodology I used for everything. Everything was pretty consistent. So what we saw here is that on average, across the runs, loading the data frame, that data frame of 336,000-ish rows, took about 3.7 seconds of wall time. So it's that's about what you see from your experience as well, because what you have to add to that wall time is the latency to move up and down across the internet. And just so you know, I ran all of these tests on my Dell laptop, my trusty Dell laptop, which is about, geez, four years old now. <laughs> so it's not a super awesome piece of hardware, 16 gigs of RAM. I used a wired internet connection from my home office. You can see the background here, my house. And I have a pretty good internet connection, but I live in Montana, so it's nothing to write home about. That scales pretty well. So it gets a green check mark. I mean, plenty of people wait longer for Excel to chunk through things in the math <laughs> regularly. And then you can see here various types of visualizations that I commonly use when I'm visually analyzing data, especially when I'm analyzing data for building machine learning models, advanced analytics. These are the kinds of things that I do. So I do histograms and count plots, which is in uh, Seaborn terminology. Seaborn is a library in Python and Excel that allows you to create visualizations. This essentially is a bar chart for categorical data. They call it count plot. And Scatter plot, And you can see here that the wall time is all pretty reasonable, right? So I'm making a histogram of 336,000-ish values, and it took less than half a second. Single count plot, about a half a second. Scatter plots were even faster, which kind of makes sense because actually creating a scatter plot is less intensive from a compute perspective because you don't have to count anything up. And then I moved into facets. And if you're interested in understanding why facets are super important, I'll put a card up here to one of my videos on my channel where I talk about how you might want to use faceted visualizations for advanced analytics, something that's kind of difficult to do if not possible to do most of the time in out-of-the-box Excel. So you can check that video out. And what we can see here is I'm running multiple histograms at the same time as part of my faceted visualization. And that does push the time up, but still very, very reasonable. So they all get check marks. So this scales pretty well. So next up we have clustering. So I used the K-means algorithm, which is a very commonly used go-to algorithm for doing cluster analysis. And I used it from the scikit-learn library, which comes built in with Python and Excel. And what we can see here is something a little bit more interesting. Okay, notice here we have that first data frame, which clocked in at 56-ish megabytes, if I recall. And this is the smaller data frame. And let's look, let's look at what happened here. So first up, loading it, no problem, not surprisingly, right? It took about 3.2 seconds. Now the elbow method is a technique, one technique for analyzing your data to say, how many clusters are reasonable for me to use? So K means you have to tell it how many clusters to find, three clusters, four clusters, five clusters, whatever it might be. So the elbow method is a technique for doing that. And what we can see here is that I'm going to say this doesn't actually scale right now. In April 2024, this does not scale with Python and Excel. And here's the reason why. So typically what you do is you try out a range of values when you do the elbow method. You look at two clusters, three clusters, four clusters, so on and so forth. You can see here, I tried out clusters ranging from two to 10, right? Two, three, four, all the way up to 10. And to get this to actually work, to get the wall time of 27.4, I had to like keep reducing things down, 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 down here with the initialization parameter. And I had to set it to three to get it to work. And generally speaking, I like something much higher than this when I do my actual real world work. So that's why I'm saying eh, it didn't scale. At the time this recording doesn't scale, which is too bad because you absolutely have to do this if you're gonna do cluster analysis with k-means. You actually have to do it. So I'm a little disappointed by this, but it is what it is. I'll talk more about why I'm not like throwing Python in Excel out the window <laughs> at this point. But right now, eh, that's so great. Now, when I actually performed the clustering, I performed it and it took about 26.5 seconds of wall time. And I found six clusters. So I had the algorithm find six clusters in the data. And I was able to use an in initialization of 25, which is 
typically what I'm looking for, something around this size. So that was okay. So I could actually cluster this stuff pretty well. That wasn't a problem. It was actually just being able to find what was the optimal value for the clusters because this elbow method told me six. That's what I used. So that's a little disconcerting. You can get around that right now by just copy and pasting the code across multiple cells and just running it multiple times. You could do that. It's kind of like a hacktastic way of doing it, which will work. It's not great, but it is what it is right now. Now, not surprisingly, with the much smaller data set, right, the one that clocked into like less than one megabyte, totally scales, no problem. Elbow method, no problem. Look here, I went from two clusters all the way up to 20. I got my initialization at 25, which I wanted, and it took about 4.5 seconds. So this is gonna be a recurring theme that I'm gonna talk about here in a second. And then lastly, the clustering was like ridiculous like less than one second, 0.2 seconds. Now, all of this is telling us a story which is consistent across my testing, which is it's not so much the 100 megabyte limit that's going to be the problem most of the time, at least for data science work. It's actually going to be the compute because right now there is a timeout. So if your execution takes too long, you'll just see a timeout error in your worksheet. And that can be a little bit frustrating because some of the things that you do in data science actually take a lot of wall time. So I'm going to talk later about why I'm not necessarily once again throwing Python out the, out the window right now. But right now it's like, you know, you have to really keep that in mind. It's not so much about the data, it's about the compute. How long does it take to actually do stuff? Now, moving on, we've got decision trees. And as promised, notice that loading the data frame, super fast, right? So this was the 32,000-ish rows of data loaded just fine. But notice this, though. Notice that originally it started at 3.7 megabytes, but once the data frame was encoded for machine learning, for example, taking your categorical features and transforming them, cleaning stuff up, the actual data frame comes back and then gets expanded. So it starts at 3.7 megabytes, and then I transform it for machine learning into something that is now 22.6 megabytes. So that's super important, right? You're still working with that 100 megabyte limit. And your final, quote unquote, version of your data frame, of your table of data that you're going to be using for machine learning and data science is usually a lot bigger than what you start with because of the things that you need to do to the data. You can't take, like, for example, a 50 megabyte file and then encode it for machine learning because it'll, it'll just blow up to be too big. So notice that we're still okay though. 22.6 megabytes is well below the limit. And then what we can see here is I did things like tune the tree. So if you're interested in learning how to tune trees, my free machine learning courses in the description below, I have one for that. And tuning the tree, I used 10 fold cross validation repeated once which is not great. Typically the gold standard is tenfold cross-validation repeated 10 times, but I just did this once across nine various combinations of hyperparameter values. And that took about 15.1 seconds. And does it scale? I'm gonna put a check mark here and say, yeah, it does. I'm not super happy with this. I would prefer to be able to say, hey, do tenfold cross-validation repeated 10 times across the nine values. That times out. It's just too much work. It just the, the container has to spin for too long, and then Python and Excel just times it out. So the reason why this gets a checkbox is, is once again, you could actually copy and paste this code across multiple cells. So for example, if I wanted to simulate tenfold cross-validation repeated 10 times, I could just copy the code down 10 cells and just run each one, and then aggregate the results myself. Kind of hacktastic, but it does work. So that one gives a check mark. Actually training the model, once I find the right hyperparameters to make an optimal tree, that was ridiculously fast. <laughs> <laughs> a hundredth of a second, essentially. So no problem there. And then permutation importance. This one's super important. This is something that I commonly do in my work because when I create machine learning models, for example, to analyze data, I often need to report the results to stakeholders. And to do that, I need some ability to tell them, hey, what features were actually found to be the most important in terms of creating the predictions? And that's what permutation importance is for. It is very very compute intensive. You can do permutation importance once, right? Where you actually go through all the features and check each one, see which ones are most important. But typically what you want to do is you want to repeat that process more than once and then average the results. So you get a much better idea of what's going on. So that's what this 10 repeats means. So I was able to do the permutation importance total of 10 times across 91 features. Because remember, that's what happened, right? This is why our data frame exploded in size is because we have now have 91 features, 91 columns. <laughs> And that took about 18.7 seconds of wall time. So this gets a check mark. This, this works out pretty well. And generally speaking, you could, if you needed to, you could lower the repeats. If your data frame got bigger and bigger and bigger, that's okay. It's not great. It's not ideal, but you could do it. So this is, scales pretty well. 
So, so far, everything's looking pretty good for decision trees. Now, not surprisingly, when we move into random forests, we get a different outcome. So let's take a look at that. So here we go. Here's the stuff for random forests. Now I'm using the random forest classifier from scikit-learn. I use the decision tree classifier from scikit-learn on the previous slide. And notice what we've got going on. It's the same data frame, because notice it gets encoded to 22.6 megabytes, as we saw before. And now we run into problems. If you're not familiar with random forests, not surprisingly, based on the name, they are collections of many trees. So what you do is you actually get 100 decision trees by default and actually combine them together to make a forest, not surprisingly. And what we can see here is when I was trying to tune the random forest, I used tenfold cross-validation repeated once, 100 trees, that's the default, and I only tried to tune one hyperparameter value. <laughs> and it timed out, it wouldn't work. This is not surprising because random forests are way more compute intensive than a single decision tree because the random forest actually has 100 decision trees. So if I do 100 decision trees in every one random forest and I'm doing tenfold cross-validation, I need to actually train 1,000 trees because 10 times 100 is 1,000. So it's not surprising that that times out. That's an X. Doesn't scale. But I got to put an asterisk on this, okay? Because if you're familiar at all with random forests, you know that the way random forests work arguably means that they don't need tuning in the traditional sense using cross-validation. If that doesn't make any sense to you, don't worry about it. There are actually alternative ways to kind of tune your random forest without using cross-validation. So this, this X has an asterisk about it at the time of this recording once again. Next up, when I'm training the RF, uh, the random forest here, you can see here that I set to be, it set it to be 300 trees, not the default of 100, but 300 trees. I also asked it to keep track of the out of box, um, excuse me, the out of bag score, the OOB score, which is actually a little bit extra work for the algorithm to do, a extra, little extra compute. And it also worked just fine. It worked in 18.8 .8 seconds. So that scales okay. I got to put an asterisk on this as well. Generally speaking, 300 trees is not a lot. For example, in the R programming language, the default is 500 trees, <laughs> not 100. This broke at 400. It timed out at 400. It just wouldn't go past 300 trees. So yes, it scales insofar as the number of trees is relatively small. It doesn't make me super happy. But can you actually produce a viable model with only 300 trees? Yeah, a lot of the times you can. Depending on the nature of your data, totally can. So it gets a green check mark again with an asterisk. And then permutation importance? Nope. <laughs> it just did not, did not work, right? Even just doing one repeat of 91 features just takes the computer way too long. So this timed out. So this doesn't scale very well. And there are all the tests, right? Here are the numbers, here are the methodology that I use, here are the scenarios. So now we can get the verdict. So what's the bottom line? Can you do real data science in Python and Excel as of April, 2024? My answer is a qualified yes. As my testing demonstrates, the main concern with Python and Excel right now for data science isn't necessarily about the data constraint, which is real, but most of the time not that big of a deal. It's more about the computation. It's more about the CPU. Specifically, when you do data science, you're doing a lot of CPU intensive things. And right now the container in Python and Excel is really small. So we just can't do much before it times out. And that's not surprising given the fact that Microsoft's offering that for free right now. But because Python and Excel runs in the cloud, it's going to be ridiculously easy for Microsoft to address these issues. They can allow you to, for example, adjust your timeout, make it higher so that you can just let things run longer. They can give you the option, which I think they will, of asking for a bigger container, a bigger computer in the cloud. They'll charge you for it, of course, which is why I think they'll do it. But that makes sense, right? You just spin up what you need, do your data science work, and then it spins back down, easy peasy. And then lastly, they could also give you a combination of the two. That's why Python and Excel does not need to be thrown out the window right now, because the future for Python and Excel, I believe, is very, very bright in 2025 because of the flexibility that the cloud architecture offers. By the way, just so you know, I'm gonna be switching gears with my Python and Excel videos. I've been talking about stuff at a higher level in most of my videos right now. What I'm gonna do is actually switch over to showing some hands-on demonstration of doing data science using Python and Excel. For example, things like doing text analytics using Python and Excel. So when that video is ready, it's gonna show up here on the screen as a tile. And in the meantime, what I'll do is I'll put another one of my machine learning related Python and Excel videos up. So you can watch that if you're interested. So there you have it. Yes, you can use Python and Excel for real data science work in April 2024, and more than likely in 2025, it's gonna be super awesome. So until next time, please stay healthy, and I wish you very happy data sleuthing.